I, I'd like, if you would, to visualize visualize a table, if you would, with three rounded shell casings or shells on the table, and the P there. And you could call the P uh, sacred names. The Elijah to come, that apostle, or wherever other names that you hear bandied around out there. And those we put under the, under the heading of the physical. Okay? If you were to ask the world's population their religious beliefs, almost one third of the world would say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. That's a lot of people. That's upwards of two billion people. Last time I looked at the population of the world. But Christianity is itself comprised of many different denominations and sects. There's so many. There's just so many. And so many of which, to, of which claim to represent the Jesus Christ of the Bible represent him and his teaching and the teaching of the apostles and so on. Into this incompatible mix comes the very small Church of God movement. And we, the Church of God, we number now, our groups number now in the hundreds. Just in the hundreds. We, of course, the Church of God, we claim that we're being led by the Holy Spirit of God. That makes us different from everybody else. But this, of course, begs the question, why the division? Why all the groups? If we're all being led by the same Holy Spirit, why? Why is this happening? It does seem that the teachings in the main are, are very similar, They're very similar. And the differences in so many cases are made up. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, if you would. The differences seem to be all, you know, more personalities and vanities, and, and I refer back again to the the Elijah to come, and so on. Uh, where are we? We're 1 Corinthians. And that was chapter 3. And we'll begin in, in, verse, uh, in verse 3. Here Paul says, You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned in each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. God makes it grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each one will be recording, uh, rewarded according to his own labor. And we look at the, the vanities and the divisions and, and some of the preaching that goes on out there, and some of the divisions are, are, are really difficult to contend with. Being surrounded as we are by the many faces and beliefs of Christianity, should we not ask ourselves the question, can a church hierarchy be wrong? Can they be wrong? Can a man make a mistake? Do men make mistakes, brethren? Really? Really? 
Is this not obvious to the pages of God's Word, the Bible? Because those pages aren't filled with man's successes. If you'll turn with me to Luke, the book of Luke, and we'll look in, in chapter, uh, chapter 6, if you would, Luke chapter 6. And we'll pick up the story in verse, in verse 46, and you probably are there already. I just have a new Bible, and it's not, it's, uh, it's not helping me here. Uh, in, in verse 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, and not do what I say? And he challenged many people of his day. People who seem sincere in their pursuit of God. They seem sincere. And he challenged them when he asked them, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Is it different today? Is it different today, brother? The church of God that we see in history has never been one large, united organization. That's never happened. It's never happened. We might think, yes, it did. We might cry about the old worldwide or this or that group. But that has never happened. There's never been from the, day, the beginning. There's been division in the church of God. If you'll, if you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And we'll have a look in verse, in verse 11. Revelation 13 and verse 11, John tells us, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. If we're looking for one united, big, single organization, this is it, brothers. This is it. I don't think it's what we want. I don't think it's what we envision at all. Jesus Christ said that he would build his church. And we know that that church is here. We know that. It would never die, he said. But how is it visible? How do we see it? How do we see the church that Jesus built? The church of God is made up of those believers in Christ, repentant, baptized, walking in humble obedience with him. In other words, doing what he says and keeping his commandments. Now the church of God, brother. In 1 John, if you'll turn there with me, 1 John, and we'll look in verse, in chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. The Bible is pretty explicit on these things. 1 John chapter 2, and we'll look in verse 3. We know that we have come to know him, John tells us, if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. It's not there. That's to the point, brother. That's to the point.
we all fall short. We all fall short. While we struggle to obey God, we continually fall short of the mark. But we don't practice sin, brethren. We don't practice it. We don't feel comfortable with it. Our conscience won't allow. That spirit of God that's in us won't allow us to relax and continue to sin. It won't happen. It won't happen. If we're comfortable with sin, then we have a real problem. And if we're walking or trying to walk with God in this satanic world, and we feel comfortable in the satanic world, then there's something really remiss. There's something really wrong here. Turn with me, if you would, to, to, uh, to, to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And we'll pick up in verse, in verse 14, if you would. Here Paul tells us, we, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Soul is a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. This describes the struggle that goes on inside every one of us, brethren. We're all familiar with it, we know what it, what it is. But we continually struggle against it. And if in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, if you'll turn up there with me, that's Ephesians chapter, chapter 4, if you would. And we look at verse 12. <laughs> Pardon me. In verse 12, here Paul tells us to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This takes a lot of struggle, brethren. It takes a lot of years. It takes a lot of... of, of, of just a lot of struggle. What better way of saying it is there than that? But does it matter what group we attend with? Does it matter what the name is over the door? Is that important to God? I, I want you to think, who, who is man to tell our Heavenly Father where to call people? Who is man to tell Jesus Christ who he can teach and who he cannot teach. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. We see the shell moving around and the pea hidden on a daily basis. We struggle against the seat. I used to think when I came into God's church first, quite a number of years ago, I was baptized and I thought, Thank God, I'm not deceived anymore. How naive. How naive. I discovered that I'm deceived on a daily basis. And there are many out there who are trying to do that, trying to deceive us. It's ongoing. Satan has many helpers. And he doesn't sleep, doesn't have to eat, he doesn't take a break. He's alive and well. We must stay awake, brethren, and, and if the leadership of the organization that we belong to begins to teach what's contrary to the Word of God, then it's up to the members, it's up to us to correct it or leave. There are choices. 
Turn to, with me, if you would, to 3 John. 3 John. We're all familiar with these scriptures, brethren. They're here for us. They're here for the guide us. And they're here sometimes to jolt us. 3 John. I bet it's a long time since you turned to, ter- to, to, to 3 John. <laughs> it's a very small, very small letter, isn't it? But there's something so, so important here. And something that we tend to forget. And, and we've tended to forget about it for a long time. In 3 John, chapter no, or verse 9, we read the letter from John. I wrote to the church by but Diotrephes, who loves to be first. How ring bells, brethren? Who would love to be first? Bob told us about the apostles arguing about who was going to be first. And it's, it goes on and on and on, and it's still with us to this very day. Who loves to be first will have nothing to do with us. He won't have anything to, anything to do with John. So if I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. Does that ring bells, brother? He refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of his, his church. His church. Not God's church, I mean his church. God will not take care of it. He won't do that. He's given us the ability and the responsibility to deal with these things. And you say, maybe, really? If that wasn't so, there wouldn't be a traditional Christianity. There wouldn't be all those divisions out there, brethren, if God was taking care of it. If God was taking care of it, the church of God wouldn't have 500 different groups or whatever it is today if God was taking care of it. He's given you and I the ability, the knowledge, the understanding, and the responsibility comes along with that knowledge to deal with these things. And we must deal with it. We must do that. We are told to watch. But watch what? What are we supposed to watch? Some would have us believe that it's Europe growing up and and the military might of Europe coming along. And the beast is on the way. We, We read about these things in all these magazines and so on. Sensationalism. That's what it is. Sensationalism. Will the Roman Empire, will the armies of the Roman Empire sneak up on us in ballet slippers, brethren? (laughs) Think about it. They'll be wearing boots. We'll hear them coming. (laughs) Oh, we'll hear them coming. Is our eternal life in danger from the Pope? Or the Archbishop of Canterbury? They're too obvious to us, brethren. We understand. We, we know. They're, it's too obvious. They won't deceive us. They won't do that. Our eternal life isn't in danger from, from these sources, brethren. Our physical, our physical well-being might be, but not our eternal life. No. It's not a threat to us. These dangers are, are, are obvious, Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. It's a chapter that's well used by the Church of God International. If I could find it in my new Bible. (laughs) (coughs) Excuse me. And we'll, we'll pick up in verse, in verse 11. We're told 
by Paul to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. This is what I'm talking about here with this deceit. Because that's the devil's, they're the devil's schemes. The shell game and the pea, they're distractions. They're di to distract us from our real purpose here. That's what they're doing. And they're doing a very, he's doing a very good job of it. And he really is. <laughs> he has us running all over the place, doesn't he? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, brethren, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, Paul tells us. But flesh and blood is used against us. It's used against us. In Acts chapter 20, if you'll turn back there with me. Acts chapter 20. And we'll go through a little, few, few pages of the Bible here. Acts chapter 20. And we'll, we'll begin in verse 29 and read through to 31. Paul talking to the, that same church, the Ephesian church. In verse 29, he said, I, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Really? Yeah, that happened then too. It's happened right from the very beginning. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears, with tears, because he could see it coming. False shepherds are not a new danger to God's people at all. But brethren, am I speaking out against the church of, uh, of God being organized? No, I'm not. Not at all. Not in the least. Because we're commanded by God to come together. And we need a church government in order to help us stay that way. We need that church government to help us to do the things that we see done. We're here. The Feast of Tabernacles. We see television programs from the various groups. Magazines and so on and so forth. Books. We need organizations to do all these things, by the way. So I, I'm, I'm certainly not speaking against organization. Not, not, not at all. I, in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, oh, we need organization. To, it, it, it's absolutely required to keep us together. Matthew 16 and, and verse, uh, verse 18, I believe. Verse 18. And, and here, G Jesus tells his disciples, and, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the grave, will not overcome it. The church is here, brethren. Satan cannot defeat it. Nothing can stop it. It's here. When we join together, if you'll have it, we are a manifestation of the Spirit of God. That's what we are here, gathered together, a manifestation of God's Holy Spirit. Because many of us struggled like crazy to get here. We went through all kinds of things, determined to come here, and to other areas where the feast, God's feast was being held. We are, brethren, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. As a church, God enables the, us to preach the gospel, to teach and encourage others. Mm -hmm. and, and we know we're commanded to do that in Matthew 28. He has given us the opportunity and the understanding to see the importance of, of meeting on the Sabbath. 
it's so it's so it's vital for us. It's absolutely vital. We can hear a good sermon, a good, a, good, a good message. But we can learn just as much by our interaction with each other. God brings us together, brethren, and we come from all walks of life. We're, we're like, when, when you get a room, look at this room. Some of us are like chalk and cheese. I mean, really, we never normally come together. But God has us together, and we're going to learn, and we're going to learn together to love each other, because without love, we're nothing. We don't go anywhere. That is a requirement of Jesus Christ. We must do that. And this is the challenge. This is the beginning of the challenge for us. And it doesn't matter where God's call out ones are, what group they're in. If they're trying to walk with Jesus Christ, then they're our brethren. And we must love them. It's a lot better if we're all together, we can grow together. We, we, we're going to jar on each other, brethren. We're going to really annoy each other by times. Surprise, surprise. But we've got to learn to love each other. We have to put any differences aside, our, our, our own personal whatever. We have to walk together in humility because we're commanded to do that. We really are, but the, the, the Bible's explicit on this. We can grow together, and, and this is our golden opportunity to do that. In Genesis, Bob talked about Genesis here in the beginning. Genesis, we'll turn to it, Genesis chapter 1. And I, I, I really love this scripture. And you might say, well, I've noticed that, Al, because you talk about it all the time. <laughs> in, in Genesis chapter 1 and, and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. In our, in our likeness. And we are made in the image of God. We are made that way. But he's in the process of continuing his creation. We're not finished. We're not a finished product, brethren. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, while we're here. We read, Now the Lord God had planted the garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Why? Why? Why did he put the man in the garden? Well, it was to keep the garden. But was it just to plant flowers and cut the lawn? No. No, it wasn't, brother. No, it wasn't. No. Pick up in verse 8, if you would, of chapter 2. Or verse, I'm sorry, ver verse 15. He took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Yes. But he was doing something else. He told the man, you shall not. Well, what's he doing? He's teaching the man. He's teaching him. You drop on down to, to Genesis 3. And we'll pick up in verse 2. For those who say, well, he was just teaching the man. <laughs> Satan, the, the woman said to the serpent, because Satan's talking to her, and she said, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say. See, God was teaching the woman, too. God is teaching the brethren. That, that's, that's what they were there for. That's what they were there for. God created us in his image only. 
And when we're we're baptized, we are back, if you'll have it, back to that garden. And God is teaching us, brethren. That's what he's doing. That's why we're here. God is teaching us. The process continues. He's continuing our creation, but not the physical, as the, the, the... Evolutionists would have it. I mean, what can God, what can anything do, happen? Th- this body's no good. I mean, it's going to die. It it's, it's functions for a while. It does the job it's supposed to do. And then we die. God says, this lives. That's what lives. Everything that makes you, you, will continue. It's with God the Father after you die. And he will raise you up in a new body. The old body is discarded. I mean, what, 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 it's no good for anything. It's, 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 it's done its purpose. It's done its purpose, rather. He's continuing his creation in us. Tur- turn with me to Ephesians again. Ephesians chapter 4, as you would. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll, we'll look in verse 22. Paul tells us in verse 22, You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what's taking place in us now, brethren. Turn back with me to John chapter 15, if you would. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse verse 5. Here is the church of God. Here is the real church of God. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, the body. The head thinks for the body. The body does not think for the body. The head does that. Thank God. Thank God. In verse 13, if you'll drop down to verse 13 with me. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. If you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. The church without division, brethren. God teaches us. Jesus Christ makes it known to us. If there's something we don't understand, something we're having a problem with, we kneel before God. God Almighty, and he will show us. If God had the ability to open our minds, to come here, to teach, to show us, to take us out of this world of deceit, then surely he has the ability to tell us what his name is. Right? 
He has the ability to teach us all the things if we get on our knees and we ask it as there's things we don't understand. Scripture tells us not to put our trust in any man. In chapter 14, if you'll just turn there with me, chapter 14 of John. And again, we look at verse 15. And Jesus tells us, if you love me, he told it then, by extension, he's telling you and I right now. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. Forever, brethren. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. In you. That Holy Spirit resides in you right now. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. We will see him. We will see him, brethren, because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Jesus Christ is with us, brethren. And we, we must never doubt that. He is the head of the body, and the head thinks for the body. And, and we've got to... Uh, uh, people can lose connection with the head. And I think we've seen some of that over the last years. God will not go with us if we fall from the vine, if we separate from us, from the vine. We, he won't go with us. He won't do that. We, we're told here again and again that he will not go with us. There is no middle man, brethren. Jesus Christ is the vine. We are the branches. There is no middle man. We're not talking about some kind of buy and sell and, and business here where the middle man gets in between to make profit. There is no middle man. There is no middle man. Jesus told us, you call, you say, Father in heaven. You have direct access to Almighty God. In Ezekiel, and I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 14, if you would. And I want you to realize that there is no other in-between person or, or, or title or anything else. Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 12. In verse 12 we read, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply and send famine upon it and kill its men and their animals, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they could only save themselves. There is no man that can save you. You don't rely on a man. There is no man there that can do that. And, and, and it, it doesn't matter whether it is Noah, Daniel, or Job, or Moses, or Herbert Armstrong, or Alex Kennedy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, brother. I mean, really, the Scripture's clear on that. It doesn't matter. It's Jesus Christ. God Almighty. Jesus is the head, the head of the body. Exodus chapter 33, if you turn it back there with me. Exodus chapter 33. 
all my new Bible with the stiff pages. It's like separating a $20 bill, you know, when, when you think there's a second one there, you'll really struggle to find that second one. But you've only got 20 bucks. <laughs> Gives you inspiration. Uh, <laughs> Exodus chapter 33, and we'll look in verse, uh, verse 9. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. Brethren, God does not come to us in a pillar of cloud. He did with Moses. Look on down to verse, uh, verse 13, if you would. Moses goes on here to say to God, If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. <coughs> then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us. If God is pleased with us, brethren, how do we know? Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. Doesn't God know us by the same fruit? If the Holy Spirit of God is inside of us, shouldn't we start to produce fruit? Shouldn't we walk with God? Should we speak contrary to the word of God? No, no. Sometimes fruit takes a while to show up. I had an apple tree like that once. And it took quite a few years for, for it to see any fruit. But if, if the spirit of God is working in us, brethren, it will begin to grow. It will begin to grow us. And it will bring us more and more towards God, the things that we used to like maybe years ago, we'll find over the years, eh, we don't really like that anymore. It doesn't do for us what it once did. And you look back at your life and look back at yourself and look at that, back at the things that you like, used to like to do and so on and so forth. Have you, can you see those changes in you? I'm sure you can. Well, I'm sure you can see lots and lots of changes. You may stop and say, well, I have, I'm not changing. You think about it, brethren. I'm sure there's a lot of changes in you over the years. You're not the same person. You're not. God knows us by those same fruits, brethren. And, and he was teaching Moses. And I know we've heard about the church of God in the, in the wilderness and the Israelites and those hard-headed people. You, you know, I mean, they... they if, if you're going to compare yourself with that church of God in the wilderness, the only one you can really compare yourself to is Moses because Moses had God's Holy Spirit. Not the others. Joshua, Caleb had a different spirit. We read about that in Scripture but not the others. You can't compare yourself to them. But you can compare yourself to Moses because you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. John 14, if you would. John chapter 14. And we'll, we'll begin in verse, in verse 24. Again and again, brethren, Jesus said, 
these words you hear are not my own. They're not mine. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Again and again, Jesus said these things. The, 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 his words were not his own. He said, I do nothing. It's the Father living in me doing his work. Again and again. John chapter 5, <coughs> if you would. Verse, uh, John chapter 5, and we'll look in, we'll look in verse 19. John chapter 5 and verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. We must understand that we can do nothing without Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus did nothing without the Father. Because the Father was working in Jesus Christ to bring this to completion with him. Brethren, Jesus Christ is working in you and I now to bring us through. It's the same thing. It's the same Spirit of God. We can't rely on us any more than Jesus could rely on himself. He relied on his Father. We must rely on Jesus Christ. We cannot do it alone. We cannot do it with some other man. You read about Daniel and Job and so on. We can't do it with any other man, and no other man can do this in us. We must walk with Jesus Christ, and he must be in us to guide us and teach us. The process is continuing. Creation is continuing here. We can't lose track of that, brethren. And that, that shell game and those peas are just moving all over the place, trying to divert our attention away from what is real. Because what is real, we can't really see. Only through the fruits that grow in us. But we know in our contact with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, we know in our prayers. We have to keep close to him. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Because he is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. He's our high priest working with us right now. And in Hebrews, while we're here, turn back, if you would, to chapter 1. And, and we'll look at verse 3. <coughs> and we read in verse 3 that the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Exact. That's like coins coming through a mint. And every coin is exact. That's the understanding of that, uh, of that expression here. Exact. One in mind and purpose, the same character, the very essence of God. All that God is. I am that I am. Colossians, if you'll turn there, Colossians chapter 1. Yes, I don't know if we're running over here or Colossians chapter one. And we pick that up again in, in verse fifteen.
Here Paul tells the Colossian church and us by extension, as I say, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's the firstborn, brethren. The image came to the likeness. The firstborn. God was not finished creation in Genesis, brethren. Man was yet to be completed. The first finished product, God's Son was born 4,000 years later. Jesus Christ was the first product of Genesis 1, 26, 27. In Colossians, well, we're here, verse 18. If you'll turn down there with me. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He's the first completed product of God's labor, not man's labor. Man is not part of this equation, like that, in control and ruling and teaching. It's God that teaches. In Colossians, again, chapter 1, um, and in verse, in verse 9, while we're here, Paul tells us, for this reason, in verse 9, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption through Jesus Christ, brother. And if you look on down to verse 26, Verse 26, Paul goes on to say that this mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to you, the saints. This mystery that's been kept hidden from the world. And what, what is this mystery, brethren? What is this mystery that's been kept hidden from the world? Look at verse 27. Look at verse 27. To God, to them God has chosen to make known among the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ in you, this is the mystery of light. The hope that we have here. And, and this calling is, is not something that's of our will and our doing. And, and it, it, it's not of man's mind. It's not an academic ex exercise. It's none of these things. It's none of these things, brethren. It, it's Christ in you, teaching and molding and pruning. First John, if you would, First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, and we'll finish up in just a moment. First John chapter 5. And we'll look in verse 11, if you would. First John chapter 5 and verse 11.
In verse 11 we read, and this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And if you, if you turn back to verse 1 with me of chapter 4, chapter, chapter 4 and verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Test the spirits that come to you, brethren. Test them. To see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. I used to wonder about this. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ, my Bible says, has come in the flesh, is from God. That would probably take in about one-third, almost one-third of the earth right now, who claim that they're Christians. I mean, they believe that the Jesus Christ came and so on, and, right? No, no. That's not what John is saying. He's saying every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ is come, is come now in your flesh. Because the spirit will begin to grow and the fruit will begin to show. And you'll be recognized by that fruit. You'll be recognized by it. It is come in my flesh now. In, in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. We look in verse 17. Therefore, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. The new has come. You're a new creature, brethren. There's only one completed, the first fruits, our brother Jesus Christ. There's only one, one completed. Put, put your finger there in, in 2 Corinthians and turn, turn back to, uh, to Ephesians, if you would, with me. Ephesians, uh, chapter, Ephesians chapter 1. But hold on to 2 Corinthians. In verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our, inher our inheritance. It's guaranteed to you and I. Nobody can take it from you. God won't. Jesus Christ, Christ will not. No man can touch that. No man can interfere with that. It's a guarantee by God Almighty. Only you can abort it. Only you and I can do that. Otherwise, it's an absolute guarantee from God Almighty. If you'll turn back with me to 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. And in verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, the earthly tent, tent are, are, are of our body, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Not, it's not, not built by human hands, brother. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose. And has given us the spirit 
as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. It's absolute guarantee. It's a guarantee, brethren. And in over back, back over, if you'll turn back to, to, to chapter four with me. And verse verse seven. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. These are the jars of clay, brethren. These are the jars of clay. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. It's not from any man. It's not from us, brethren. We're made from clay. God said, let us make man. And we're made from clay. And that's the body that we're in right now, in jars of clay. And in verse 16, if you'll look down there with me. We read, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, brethren. We're being renewed. And, and keep that in mind. Every day that passes by, we're being renewed if we walk with Jesus Christ. Every day. Not a day goes by that we don't. But this is the feast of temporary dwellings. And we are the temporary dwellings. And we're here for that purpose. Brother. But stay on the vine. Stay on the vine.